So my name's Eli Zegas, and I'm the Food Systems and Urban Agriculture Program Manager at SPUR, just a couple blocks away. And what I'm going to be talking about tonight is some research we did in the past six months uh, that resulted in a, a report called Public Harvest. And there's a sort of slimmed down version of this in the back, uh, some, some of the urbanists. And, and SPUR really looked at the question of, how can we expand the use of public land for urban agriculture in San Francisco? And I can go into a little more depth about why we didn't focus on private land. I could speak about that as well, but uh, we really thought the opportunity was on public land. So, the opportunity. Here in San Francisco, you all know it's a very dense city. Uh, there's an incredible demand for space, and lots of San Franciscans want to grow food. Um, for the individuals growing food, the food is the benefit to many of them. But for the city, and what we wanted to focus on is, well, should the city be encouraging this and why? And, and we do feel like there are a number of benefits. And unless the city provides more land, support, and funding, the city won't get the benefits of urban agriculture. And just to be clear, when I'm talking about urban agriculture, I mean growing food, either plants or animals, in and around the city. That can take a number of forms. Uh, we, many of you are probably familiar with community gardens, plot-based community gardens or allotment plots. Uh, that's probably the most traditional form. But there are other types of urban agriculture. Uh, one would be communally managed. In San Francisco, examples of that would be Alamany Farm or Hayes Valley Farm, where a whole group of people manage one large plot, in essence. Demonstration gardener farm. Uh, is anyone familiar with Garden for the Environment? Okay, a couple people. That's neither growing for the production of food. Um, uh, well, let's just say it's not growing for the production of food. It's growing food and showing people how to do it. So it's less about the yield and much more about engaging lots of people and using uh, their space to teach water efficient gardening or composting or other things. School gardens would fall in this category too. Market gardener farm, that would be growing with a focus for production, for yield and for usually money. Um, in San Francisco, I'd say we only have one true commercial farm that is for profit, and that is Little City Gardens, uh, which is out in the Outer Mission or um, orchards. I, I list that separately, just be and you all probably know this far better than I do, but orchards require special care, a little different than annual plants, um, and they can be in different spaces. Animal husbandry, usually in the city, that means bees, chickens, sometimes rabbits, sometimes goats. Aquaponics, which would be mixing growing of plants with raising fish in more of a looped cycle. Greenhouses, just because they're structures, that's a different form. And then rooftop, um, and that could be greenhouses or just soil right on top of roofs. So I mentioned before the benefits. One of the things I'll just say up front, uh, and what we came to a conclusion, is that urban agriculture from the city level um, is not about the food itself. Um, or rather, it's not about the quantity of food. Um, so some people get excited that think of how much food we could produce and think of how many people we could feed. And when you're the individual gardener or you're a group of farmers, you can produce a lot of food for yourself. There's no question about that. Um, but if you are looking at a neighborhood scale, San Francisco is not going to feed itself by what it grows in the city. And very few cities are. I'd be curious. Uh, when we talk about Oakland, it has more open land and more vacant land, but I'd still be surprised. <laughs> um, Detroit is a whole other situation. Detroit has an enormous amount of vacant land, and they could feed a good portion of the city, I think, with what they grow at least some part of the year. But San Francisco is not Detroit. So the benefits that we found are, first and foremost, this connection. It's education, awareness. It's, it's letting people have a sense of what grows in our area, what the seasonality is, what a fresh strawberry tastes like, what fresh herbs taste like. In some ways this is very intangible, but it's very, very important to build um, consumers and constituents who understand our food system and have an ecological awareness. Green space and recreation, very oftentimes uh, gardens and farms provide that to people nearby. Uh, we found that the Department of Public Works said that if you took a site that had dumping, like illegal dumping, people just dropping trash off and put a, put a communally managed space there, that would save them $4,100 a year. Tried to get from the Rec and Park Department what it would save them just in landscaping costs if they had volunteers doing the landscaping and maintenance. Couldn't get that figure, but there's probably savings there as well. 
If we're looking at roofs, uh, I think you can get a lot of stormwater management. Um, or if you put soil and, and on top of paved spots, you get that as well. Um, so stormwater benefits, heat island effect benefits, b brings people together. How many people here are part of a community garden or connected to an urban farm? All right. So most of you probably know there's a community aspect to it, and it's bringing people together in a, in a space. While we can't feed ourselves from what we grow in the city totally, um, we do see urban agriculture as sort of a supplemental strategy about food access. So it's not necessarily going to provide the calories or the nutrition that people are seeking, um, but can help inform people's food choices. If they see what's growing, if they know what they like, if they know what's fresh and what fresh tastes like, uh, hopefully that will inform their food choices. And then on this economic development, a lot of people are interested in jobs and job training. There is not much, farmers don't make a lot of money. And uh, farmers have a lower cost of living than urban residents. So urban farmers don't make a lot of money either. And that makes its economic potential limited. I think there are some models there, especially in the East Bay, Dig Deep Farms is one I'm interested in, in Planting Justice and here in the city, Little City Gardens, to see if there's an economic model that works as being self-sustaining and providing employment and jobs. But I'd say that's to be seen. So how many, how many more minutes I got? Um, you've got nine Excellent. Okay, so in terms of uh, the findings, what we, we looked at really land, money, and, and resources. Land-wise, there are a whole lot of public agencies that have projects on their land. Um, and the main draw uh, is the bottom number, 76 projects on public land if you look at city, state, and federal land. Uh, and that's about 20, 21 acres under cultivation. It's a huge array, like almost every agency I could think of had at least one project. Um, this is a map, I guess it's shown up pretty well. The, the, actually, um, Noah Chrisman, son of one of the <laughs> audience members here, made this beautiful map. Um, the green dots show existing sites on public land. The yellow sites are pending projects on public land. And the orange are sites on private land. The main point I want to convey with this map is that there are projects all over the city, and they are of varying size. Most of them are between uh, less, you know, 10 to 50,000 square feet. It is rare for a site to be larger than an acre, um, and there are some that are smaller, but they obviously can't serve as many people. Okay. So there are a lot of sites. Um, if you include private land, that's over 100, but just public plan, we're looking at about 75. Uh, but the demand for space continues. And I think most of you have probably been hearing a lot more about food, a lot more about urban agriculture in the past few years. Um, and we've seen that here in the city, and 20 new projects, more than 20 new projects have started since 2008, which is a, a huge jump from previous years. And uh, waiting lists at the gardens that have plots are still very high, at least 550 that probably underrepresents actual demand. <coughs> Not all gardens have waiting lists. There are parts of the city where you could get a plot right away. Um, but for those that do have waiting lists, those waiting lists are usually, on average, at least two years or longer. There is one garden in the mission that has a wait list of at least 18 years, which is absurd. <laughs> um, and, and so we know people want space to grow food. Um, there are a lot of agencies that not only provide land, but provide funding. Uh, and we identified seven. These are their logos, um, which is fantastic. It averages about $580,000 per year over the past five years. That number has been growing, but if you use the average, most of that goes to grants to other community organizations, um, helping pay for staff, uh, water efficiency, programming. Some of it goes to maintenance of sites. and then. Uh, some of it goes to building new sites, but we haven't built too many with public funds recently, though a decent amount. So the trend has been up in recent years. Uh, the black is the total, the blue is ongoing and program expenses, the red is capital. I just point out that one garden on Reckon Park land um, just got a grant. It's a pretty small garden, and they got $235,000 in funding to start their garden. And they needed some serious terracing. They needed a lot of heavy land moving. Um, but 
it is ripe for some landscape architects to help us drive those costs down because they are very high and I don't think they need to be. So, um, we looked at San Francisco compared to other cities. Uh, we sort of, I selected the cities based on those that had sort of prominent programs. And the main point I'd love for you guys to get from this slide is that San Francisco is somewhere in the middle. I thought that the metric of how much was spent per site was useful as opposed to per acre. Or, um, and Seattle, I would say, has the gold standard program for how it supports its community gardens. Um, and New York City severely underfunds its gardens. Um, so it was just interesting to see we're about the same as Chicago. And each of these programs is different in how they're structured. But gives a perspective. Another interesting way to give perspective on how much we spend is historically. How many of you remember SLUG, San Francisco League of Urban Gardeners? Okay, so SLUG started out in the late 70s, early 80s, um, really became incorporated as a nonprofit in the 80s and or late 80s, early 90s, and then really shot off. Um, they eventually got a lot of federal block grant funding for job training um, and doing a lot more than just gardens. But they were the place you went to. If you wanted to do urban agriculture or gardens in the city, they're the ones you called. In 1997, they got city funding that is the equivalent of $1.4 million today. Um, whereas now, if you look at 2010, 2011, we spend less than a million. So over time, we've actually decreased the amount of city funding going to urban agriculture. And there are a whole lot of reasons, I think, for that. At Spur, we like to think not only talk about what the problem is, but how we might be able to fix it. And there are four main things we said this is what would, would be, this is what success looks like. Um, wait time, I mean, you guys can read them, but wait time, lowering the wait times for community gardens is a big one. Having projects on public land where residents demonstrate a desire. I think there are a lot of people who say, well, how many projects do we need to meet those waiting lists? And I would argue very strongly that there should never be an urban ag project where no one wants it. So the idea of the city or planners saying, this is where a project should be and this is where a project should be, those projects will fail. Um, and that there has to be this balance between making public resources available in terms of land and money, but also um, residents demonstrating a desire to have the project there. Because at their base, the city's not going to run them. And so you need people to demonstrate a long-term commitment. A one-stop shop, in many ways this is talking about having something like Slug. A phone number you call and say, I want to start a project. Where do I go? What do I do? Um, and then more efficient use of public funds, including lowering the costs. There are a lot of recommendations here, 10 specific ones. And I'm going to jump off the slide in just a second. But they are included in the report in the back. Um, and uh, available for download. But specific things agencies could do, one of which I want to highlight that I'd be excited about is an audit of publicly owned rooftops to see which ones were suitable for growing food. Um, and what I want to close with is that there is currently legislation that was introduced a few weeks ago that would create an urban agriculture program in the city. Um, and it would be this one-stop shop. It would try and create that. It would coordinate among agencies and then create a strategic plan for if we were to reach certain goals in a few years, what sort of resources do we need to do that? It was introduced by Supervisor Chu. And it has a hearing uh, on June 4th at the Land Use Committee. And if anyone's interested in more details about that, I'd be happy to tell you about it. But it's, it's encouraging that the city is moving towards trying to address these issues. I'd say funding is a big question. Um, and then will a city agency actually be able to do the coordination we hope it will be able to do? So uh, the report's available there. And I look forward to hearing your questions in addition to the other presenters. And I have the honor of uh, introducing Barbara Finnan of City Slicker Farms, which is an amazing project that I visited once and I am psyched to learn more about. Come on up. <laughs>